River is a book that my wife Connie and I created to tell stories about what's happened along the Missouri River since Lewis and Clark first came this direction in 1804. And what we wanted to do was make a book that children, their parents and grandparents could read and understand that they were a part of a very long and big story. The present day Marthasville was the westernmost trading settlement on the Missouri River, the turn of the 19th century. <clears throat> Lewis and Clark stopped here going up river in 1804 and again triumphant on the return to St. Louis on September 20th, 1806. This was the frontier full of Native Americans and wild game. Today I'm very excited to present uh, the Lewis and Clark story uh, even in a very quick way with you all and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the history of Lewis and Clark, what they were doing on this expedition, what they were trying to accomplish. It was the time of year when he usually saw flocks of brightly colored Carolina parakeets gawking and flitting from tree to tree. The birds roosted in the trees and they would play and hang upside down. They fed on weed seeds along the river's edge, splashing and making a racket. Their colors were bright green and orange, and they covered sycamores near the river. Okay. When you think about wildlife, we don't tend to think about North America. We tend to think about elephants, gorillas, lions in Africa, tigers in Asia, um, odd things in South America like capybaras and caiman and other things. And one thing we also tend to think about in the tropics are parrots. But parrots used to be found here in the United States. Just across the river, people owned slaves. The boys had been told that thousands of slaves lived in Montgomery County, but no slave owners were in Herman. Beginning in 1845, Neal wrote against slavery. He argued that slavery was against the high principles on which the United States was established in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble of the Constitution. Steamboat coming, steamboat coming, steamboat coming, black smoke fills the sky. So I like to study steamboats. And so how lucky for me um, that the steamboat um, and the story we were hearing today, the Montana, is one of the, the, the steamboats that I had the chance over the years to excavate. And so we're going to take a look uh, together at 10 images that help us understand the story of the steamboat Montana and its role um, in, in the history of the Missouri River and more specifically um, how it relates to New Haven and St. Charles and St. Louis and, and all of that um, part of the world. Last year's flood still had everyone talking. The river had carved new channels and roared through places along the river bottom where it had never been before. The Missouri River that ran through our state 100 years ago was very different from the river that we have today. When you sit on the banks now or float on its strong current, you can tap into that old ancient river and feel that same power. But we're gonna spend a little time exploring some of the changes that we've made to the river since then. father said, I am not going to plant another crop on land that is just going to get flooded. And I am not going to build another barn and then watch it go floating down the river. When the grown-ups talked about serious things like this, they still spoke in German. It's important to remember that the girl's great-grandparents had come all the way from Germany to live in the United States many years before. And they, like many other German people, they settled along the Missouri River Valley. It's amazing to uh, 
think about all the many people who came to St. Louis and to Missouri from all over the world and the wonderful story of the German settlers who we just heard was a very fine example of that. The Missouri Botanical Garden, affectionately called Shaw's Garden, was started by an English immigrant in 1859. It's the oldest botanical garden in the United States, actually, and uh, a wonderful treasure for the people of St. Louis to enjoy. She was the luckiest girl in the world because her best friend lived with them. Yep, grandma moved in last year and was just about the best thing imaginable because they did projects together. They read books and wrote letters to her pen pal. They watched Roy Rogers, Mickey Mouse on TV, and even better, she loved to fish. Grandma liked to say they were bluegill buddies. The bush area is surrounded. It's Back in 1947, when it was purchased, it was huge. Who could imagine almost 7,000 acres of undisturbed land where you could have deer that were being reintroduced. You could have turkey that were coming back. All these animals that had kind of been scarce because of the, the Weldon Springs site and everything that they did. So you're seeing all these things come back. And when they got this area, they put in lakes. And like you heard in the story, we have over 30 lakes. There are 28 lakes, uh, like in this picture, that you can fish at. The Katie Railroad tracks ran along the river bluff and next to the farm fields in the river bottom below the town. But there were no trains. Their parents said that the trains used to stop to drop off and pick up all sorts of goods. The twins couldn't remember those days and just had to pretend that trains were still rolling past the town. They walked along the tracks, jumping from one railroad tie to the next and made their own train whistle sounds. The Katy Trail, now stretching 290 miles across Missouri, is the longest developed rail trail in the United States. The Katy Trail has been inducted into the National Rail Trails Hall of Fame. It is part of the American Discovery Trail, and it's the longest non-motorized section of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. And on one hike, far out on the trail near Marthasville, they found a special tree, a huge bur oak on the hill overlooking the river. Its branches were as big as trunks of most trees. And if all of the children had linked arms, they couldn't have reached all the way around it. Grandpa told them it was probably more than 200 years old. Welcome to the magical McBain Bur Oak. I first laid eyes on this grand tree back in 1980 when I was a Mizzou forestry student. I was told about this grand big tree down in the, the uh, river bottoms of the Missouri River. And so I made my way there, even came back with my date that I ended up marrying 36 years ago. So this was an important tree to me like it has been to a lot of other people. We don't know what wind and ice storms will have tested the branches of the growing bur oak or what floods may have covered its roots. We don't know what a 2040 ride on the Katy Trail will reveal about the changes in the bluffs, wetlands, and fields along the trail. Will the land in the floodplain and on the bluff tops still be growing crops and trees? Or, or will it be sprouting shopping centers and houses? You know, if we can show people, or show our people, our children, our families, and ourselves the value, and, and we can experience nature, wherever that might be, um, you know, something changes within us. And I think that's, that's what's going to impact 2040, 2060, um, and beyond. And that's really going to be what secures conservation as a legacy that's important to Missouri. Um, and something that I think people will really recognize as a significant and unique place for us to be living here right now. I hope that every family who sits down and reads this book 
regardless of the age of the reader, takes away that we have a truly magical state, that we could maybe experience it just on the interstates and not have that experience, but if we really get out into the Missouri countryside, that we have a state that's just full of stories and history that we ought to all know about and we'd be prouder of the state that we've chosen to call home. Peppermint cheese and the soda water fountain.